Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aaron Cohen Gadol. I'm a neurosurgeon with a special expertise in management of uh, pituitary tumors, and I'd like to talk to you today about general information that is important for you if you're undergoing an operation for a pituitary uh, tumor. So let's uh, start with the definition of a pituitary gland. The normal gland is a small bean-shaped gland located below um, uh, the brain at the level of the skull base. It weighs less than about a gram. It's often called the master gland since it controls the most important functions of your body, including metabolism, growth, sexuality, and uh, reproduction. This is um, an example. These three images are examples of a pituitary adenoma, as you can see in orange. And the last image on the right in white, you can see how the large these tumors can get. They're right at the level of the skull uh, base and between your eyes and slightly in the back of the head. The pituitary gland has two portions. One is the anterior portion or near the front of the gland. That's called the adenohypophysis. And one is in the posterior portion near the back of the gland called the neurohypophysis. Another component that is important to know about is the optic nerve that's um, involved in vision and how this part of the brain gets implicated is the fact that the optic nerves can carry information from the vision from your eyes to the brain and these uh, um, optic nerves are located right on top of the pituitary gland. When pituitary tumor occurs in this region, they can really compress the optic nerve and elevate them and lead to compromise of your vision. In fact, the visual compromise is the most common presenting symptom for a pituitary adenoma. So what are the hormones produced by the pituitary gland? Number one is the thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones and uh, involve for growth and management of your metabolism. Then it's the growth hormone that regulates growth, and then it is the adrenocorticotropic hormone that triggers the adrenal to release cortisol. Luteinizing hormone is, controls the sex hormones and sperm and egg production. Prolactin stimulates secretion of the breast milk, and vasopressin allows water to be absorbed by the kidneys. What are the types of pituitary tumors? And this is a critical piece of information. These benign tumors occur about 15 people per 100,000 in the population and are typically diagnosed in two forms. Type 1 of the pituitary adenomas or tumors are active and functional and they are diagnosed based on overproduction of their hormones. They can be called prolactinomas because they overproduce prolactin. They can cause acromegaly because, and that's caused uh, by significant overproduction of the growth hormone or Cushing's disease because they're producing extra levels of the adrenocorticotropic hormone that I discussed a moment ago. More commonly, these tumors are inactive and they're non-functioning and they really don't produce any hormones that are very functional or they may produce hormones that are not really very important and because they can grow, they eventually press on the optic nerve and can lead to some closure of the vision, especially on the sides of your visual field. And therefore, patients present with visual complaints after seeing their eye doctor. So um, if the patient has extra secretion or production of prolactin, this may cause a milky discharge from their breast called galacturia. It may lead to irregular menstrual period, reduction in the sex drive and infertility. And also uh, bleeding into these tumors obviously uh, can cause what we call apoplexy and lead to significant sudden visual loss and even blindness. Medical therapy is the first line of treatment and usually promocryptin or paralladel or other medications may be used medically and those are quite effective and in fact most prolactin producing tumors or prolactinomas can be treated medically 
without a need for surgery. So it's really important to avoid surgery if it's not needed. So how about acromegaly? It's because, over, it's because of overproduction of the growth hormone. The soft tissue thickening of palms and hands occur. The patients offer complain about the ring fingers getting tight or shoe sizes uh, getting dramatically um, larger despite the fact that they're no longer in puberty or they're way after the age of puberty. And also some of the facial features can get very um, significantly changed, such as their jaws can be elongated, their hands can um, enlarge, even their head size and head size can change significantly. Their forehead can increase leading to frontal passing and um, they may even present with heart disease and heart enlargement. And that's the major issue with acromegaly and that's why it should definitely be treated and not left alone because it can lead to significant heart disease and shorten the life of the patient. Other uh, diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and gigantism, which means um, overgrowth of a patient in obviously in their height, can be a presentation, but usually gigantism occurs before puberty. Acromegaly occurs after puberty. As you can see in this picture, this is a patient from a father of neurosurgery, Hiver Cushing, and the first picture uh, with a patient with his hand on his chest demonstrates uh, a clear example of acromegaly, and the two images on the other side demonstrate earlier life picture and later life picture, and how you can see the hands are enlarged, the skin is thickened, and facial features, and the jaw shape has been significantly altered. So how do we diagnose acromegaly? That's via blood test, elevation of growth hormone, and insole-like growth factors, and also comparison of old and recent photographs can be quite effective for your physician to make a diagnosis. Unfortunately, most of these patients are underdiagnosed and go many years without a correct diagnosis because the features are very mild and um, some of the medical problems really can go under-noticed as well. So it's really important for the physicians to be vigilant and know about this disease and be able to, to treat it effectively as a timely treatment can really uh, increase the life of the patient and the quality of life as well. So uh, how do we diagnose these besides blood tests? We do magnes magnetic resonance imaging or an MRI to see the tumor on the MRI. And the first line of treatment is transvenoral surgery. In other words, surgery through the nose to remove the tumor. And also if there is a residual tumor or recurrent tumor after surgery has been performed, radiation or medical therapy may be indicated. Another disabling disorder that is very much underdiagnosed and unfortunately often goes too far before the patient and the physicians can diagnose it is Cushing's disease. It can be a very disabling disorder. It causes significant weight gain, especially in the face, and leads to moon faces, as we call it, as you can see on these images. It's a fat deposit on the back that you can also sometimes notice. It's called a buffalo hump. Um, skin changes with easy bruising, purple stretch marks called stria and red cheeks, uh, in other words, what we call plethora, can also be very much uh, typical uh, symptoms and signs related to this tumor. Excess skin growth in the ladies and um, menstrual irregularities in women can be a problem. Decreased fertility and sex drive or libido, hypertension, diabetes, and depression are also quite common. As you can see, the symptoms are relatively non-specific. So again, the diagnosis is often delayed for years. Endocrinological evaluation is quite important. Um, it is a, very important to do extensive blood and urine tests because this diagnosis is very difficult in, the, in its mild and moderate forms. Uh, your high resolution MRI is critical in um, big centers that perform this special form of MRI. And sometimes you may need an angiogram where they pass a catheter in your groin and measure the level of the um, cortisol in different parts of your head to be able to see which side of the um, uh, pituitary gland can be more hyperactive if MRI is not very clear. 
At the end, the diagnosis is critical and requires significant expertise and therefore evaluation by a special endocrinologist can be quite important in terms of making the diagnosis. As we discussed for other pituitary tumors, transmural surgery is most effective in terms of removing as much of the tumor as safely as possible. Please note, larger tumors can be very difficult to cure, and that's why earlier diagnosis is so important. The smaller the tumor, the, most effect, the more effective the surgery can be in providing cure. Medical therapy is not as effective as surgery, and also residual tumors may be treated with radiation or radiosurgery. Um, another important definition is microadenoma is less than one centimeter, in its largest diameter and macroadenoma is more than one centimeter in its largest diameter as we define them. Functional tumors are technically found earlier because they produce those hormones and lead to noticeable signs and symptoms. Non-functional tumors don't produce the hormones and typically they have to reach a much larger size in order to be uh, detectable via um, the pressure they put on the eye and causing headaches or vision problems. Non-functioning tumors, the history and blood tests like TSH, thyroxine, cortisol, ACTH, LH, FSH, prolactin, growth hormone, IGF-1, all of those are effective in measuring what kind of tumor is there. Ophthalmological evaluation is critical for larger tumors to measure the loss of peripheral vision and be able to assess how much recovery can be achieved after surgery. And um, most often, these tumors are found incidentally when an MRI is done for other reasons such as head injury. And if the tumors are relatively small and asymptomatic and not producing any hormones, they can be observed. For non-functioning tumors, again, transfrontal surgery is very effective, especially there's evidence of optic nerve compression causing visual abnormalities. If the tumor is very small and not causing any symptoms, it can be observed. If it is moderate size and not causing any symptoms, we'll still recommend surgery in younger patients to avoid any um, uh, vision loss in the future, as these tumors can grow about one to two millimeters per year. Radiation can also be very effective for res recurrent or res uh, residual tumors. There is another class of tumors called craniopharyngiomas that are very related to pituitary adenomas, but also very different. I want to talk to you about that as well. These tumors are very heterogeneous in their contents. They have calcium and soft tissues. I mean, therefore, we may need a CT scan to diagnose them. They often reach a large size like a macroadenoma and present with visual abnormalities. They do not secrete hormones. They may cause hypopituitarism, in other words, low pituitary function, and a transfineural surgery or craniotomy may be needed to remove these tumors. Unfortunately, craniopharyngiomas are very sticky, they're very adherent to normal structures around the region, and therefore their complete removal can rarely be achieved, and therefore they can recur, and even their recurrence can be more difficult to remove, and radiotherapy is often necessary after surgery to remove, and I'm sorry, to manage these tumors. Also, asymptomatic tumors, again, that are found on imaging that are not causing any symptoms, can be followed carefully with six months to a year MRI follow-up evaluation. Again, careful follow-up imaging is uh, critical. What are the complications related to surgery? It can be brain fluid leak through the nose, meningitis or infection in the brain, pituitary failure, there can be permanent diabetes insipidus, in other words, urinating too often and too much, very rarely stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, and very rarely blindness and visual loss. The surgical options, um, just to discuss further, are endonasal, transphenoidal, and endoscopic transphenoidal surgery. The endoscope involves using a small camera through the nose to be able to expand the visualization and remove the tumor that's minimally invasive. And very, very rarely, we use a second um, line option, such as a craniotomy, where we remove a piece of skull to remove the tumor. Overall, pituitary tumors are very commonly benign. 99% of pituitary adenomas are benign. 
they're not cancerous. That is something very important to know and be very positive about. They can be really very well managed with um, expertise of the surgeon and therefore really using a surgeon who has had extensive experience with removal of pituitary adenomas is critical for providing the best outcome for your, uh, for your care. Again, my name is Aaron cohen Gadol, and I'm more than happy to be involved and provide consultation for your care as needed. Thank you.